galiba herkes çık burada. Sunum İngilizce. <gülüyor> Okay, let's do it in English then. <laughs> uh, yeah, because my materials are all in English. Uh, let's do this. Okay, then let, let me just send you a warm welcome. This is also my first experience uh, doing a webinar at home. And so far, I can't complain because it's really cool to be in front of your, uh, your, your monitor and then like having the comfort of uh, being at home. So today, I'm going to talk about the future of mobile learning and partly uh, my doctoral dissertation of mentality in the language classroom. Uh, but before that, maybe I can quickly introduce myself. My name is Ozan. Um, I work as an instructor at Koch University. Um, I'm quite interested uh, in technology technology and its use language teaching. So I did my master's in the United States and uh, my master's thesis was on virtual reality uh, and my, my research venue was spectrum light. And after that I was uh, looking for something more uh, more interesting. You know, I'm not, virtual reality is not interesting, but uh, what is more interesting or what is beyond second life or virtual reality was augmented reality. So I ended up being uh, doing my research in augmented reality. So today we're going to start with more things. So let's just walk through together how uh, augmented reality started becoming augmented reality or where it actually comes from. So to understand how we implement augmented in the language classroom, we should maybe first explore what mobile learning is. So uh, I'm not going to get deeper into theory, but maybe it's it's better to start with a quick definition, you know, a, a short definition of what mobile learning is. Um, so according to Kukulska Hulme, one of the pioneering uh, research in, in the field of mobile as language learning. Uh, early definitions of mobile learning, which focus predominantly on the attributes of mobile technology, have given way to more sophisticated conceptualiza conceptualizations, suggesting that mobility is the central issue. And uh, according to her, this idea denotes not just physical mobility, but the opportunity to overcome physical constraints by having access to people and digital learning resources regardless of place and time. The, the definition focuses uh, the idea of mobility being um, at the core of uh, learning. However, the discussion, the debate still goes on. If it is the mobility of the device, like the technology, or if we mean mobility, if we mean like the mobility of the learners, or if we mean the mobility of the content or resources. Uh, at this point, it seems like it's a combination of all, you know, mobility regarding the learner, the content, resources, and um, the technology. Uh, after that, maybe it's better to talk about why mobile learning is important, you know, or inevitable. It's not even important, you know, we're not even at the stage of discussing if mobile learning is uh, important or not. It's actually like how it changes our lives. According to Traxler, uh, we have to recognize that mobile, personal, and wireless devices are now radically transforming societal notions of discourse and knowledge and are responsible for new forms of art, employment, language, commerce, deprivation, and crime, as well as learning. So in a world where like, we're surrounded by connected computers or like devices like our cell phones, really impossible to, to think about uh, classrooms or education without these. So uh, again, so mobile learning is actually not out of necessity. It's just, it's just um, an obligation in this sense. So what are some main tangible benefits of mobile learning? According
according to JISC, it's a uh, it's one of the leading uh, forums or platforms on mobile and blended learning. Uh, mobile learning is personal, private, and familiar. So that means we all have like cell phones. We all have a form of a mobile device. It's our own. It's private, and we're quite familiar with it. We know how to use these devices. Uh, the, the content is pervasive and ubiquitous. That means the content is always there. Uh, whether you access it or not, it, it's, it's there and it'll, it'll stay, and it's available and accessible at any time, you know, not just during a limited period of time, like say um, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the morning, and limited with one hour. No, it's completely ubiquitous. It's at home, at work, on the go, and it's at any time. Again, this is backed up with portability feature. That means you can just learn practically um, anywhere and anytime. Uh, but learning is not guaranteed, of course. But it's possible, again. And um, it, it just captures, it gives you the opportunity to capture data and the, the learning process is like what? The devices are equipped with uh, built-in cameras. So you can use video, sound, or text input to, uh, to, to capture data and then uh, control your learning process. And it promotes active learning. Of course, with mobile learning, there are some theories uh, involved some, some new pedagogies are actually emerging with, with mobile learning. One of them is like active learning. That means the, the, the learner is at the core of the learning process and the learner is active and the learner is or has a say in, in, in his or her own learning experience and is quite autonomous in that sense. All right, so let's just take a look at the evolution of mobile learning. This is not actually for mobile learning only. Uh, it's, it can be applied to e-learning or computer-assisted um, instruction. I mean, the field is full of, um, let's say, acronyms, you know, like, like CAI or TOL or MOL or TLL. And these are all acronyms that, that, that really tell us that we're still in, in search of um, a concept or, or a definition of how to understand this process. Starting with um, early behaviorist models of learning uh, in the 1950s, let's say, with the first mainframe computers, uh, we first started with the concept of computer-assisted learning. You know, we call them computers. They were like, uh, they were like room full devices big devices, big, big devices that you would never think uh, that they have evolved to these small machines right in front of us. So uh, the idea was to, to form habits, like habit formation, you know, like stimulus response, uh, making people gain a specific activity. Okay, someone has actually raised hand. Should we, yeah, why not? Okay, let's, let's go. Here, Nathan. Can you write or I think you can speak at the moment. All right. Oh, okay. So you made a mistake. All right, no problem. No problem. Uh so it it started with behaviorist models of learning. And after that, thanks to the increase in multimedia interactivity, power, speed, portability, functionality, and bandwidth of network platforms, now we have uh, mobile learning or e-learning or the latest implementations of e-learning. Of course, it took some time for the paradigm shift in the education educational world, let's say, in the educational field, you know, 
from behaviorist models to social constructivist models, it was not really easy. But um, following the 1970s, we started uh, questioning if language learning or just learning in general is a um, is a structured or so mechanical process, or is it rather a social uh, form or social notion that uh, that learning takes place in a social environment, that people learn from each other, you know, like starting with Vygotsky, we start questioning if uh, we co-construct knowledge together, uh, again with Chomsky, you know, we started questioning uh, the deep structures, not just the surface structure, like how social and pragmatic aspect of uh, language learning is an action while um, acquiring a new language. So all these like paradigm shifts uh, led to, or let's say connected with, or merged with the advances in tech. And in the end, we have like what we call as e-learning today. Although some people, um, argue that mobile learning is not actually a new form of learning. It's, it's the extension of e-learning or it's the continuation of e-learning. Uh, some people still claim that, well, um, it has actually created its own theories. You know, there are some mobile learning theories of its own cannot really explain with e-learning. So I'm not gonna talk about all these like theoretical part of it, but this is just to provide you a brief um, background on the issue. So this is where we are in terms of uh, the educational paradigm. How about the mobile devices? Uh, of course, we had computers earlier, but EDA's personal digital assistant uh, came out of age sometime around um, 1980. In 1984, uh, the first EDA named Scion was a big um, revolution. You know, you could have your computer right in your palm, and you could really like uh, operate certain basic functions right in, in the convenience of your palm. After that, mobile phones followed, and then we had MP3 players that were quite personal again. Uh, we started listening to podcasts and everything, and then we had netbooks, smaller than notebooks, made them more mobile, and e-readers, they're still popular these days. And after that, we had tablets, and then now we're heading to wearable devices. Now it should be okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Great. So back to this wearable devices thing. Uh, so we said now we're at this point where technology is worn. It's not just what we carry. We're like uh, slowly incorporating technology into our body, which is um, scary at the same time. So 1984 is the recorded history for the PDA, but I'm sure there were some experimental studies about that. So this is the first oops, device that's called Scion. People were so happy to have it. And after that, of course, we had mobile phones and MP3 players and like netbooks, notebooks. And today, this is where we stand, you know. 
we use like goggles and uh, interesting pieces of technology. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Gartner's hype cycle. If not, I'm going to quickly um, summarize what it is. Gartner's hype cycle is a really uh, popular, uh, let's say, chart or, or trend or an explanation of how technology adoption, adoption takes place in the society. For example, when, when a new technology emerges, uh, there is this crazy demand for this technology, right? So uh, you, can, you can see how people really like try to invest in that technology. So it becomes a big fad, it becomes a big trend. And after some time, it just hits this peak, right? It skyrockets. But after some time, there is a dramatic decline as it goes all the way down to this top disillusionment. People lose their faith in this technology until someone else says, wait a second, we couldn't really do much of this technology, so let's just get back into this. And then it just starts climbing up the slope of enlightenment slowly, and then we start being uh, more productive by using these technologies. So thinking about mobile technologies, where do you think more technologies stand uh, at, let me just ask you a quick question. Can you make a guess? No? Okay, it's minus giving you a So where do you think we stand in terms of uh, mobile learning. Look at this trend. It's soaring now. Okay. Slope of enlightenment. All right. Let me get a couple more and then I'm going to show you. Come on, Ravi, yeah, you can do it. Peak of inflated expectations, I think, for the society. All right. Well, according to JISC, again, it is right in between the plateau of productivity and slope of enlightenment. Because, uh, yes, it's been almost 30 years. 30 years ago, we started with playing with these devices, right? They just became part of our, not our everyday lives, but at least we had an idea about what they are. We were so impressed with, with the idea of having these devices right in our shame. But we couldn't really do much with mobile phones. So uh, let's say mid 2000s, you know, like, I mean, I'm talking about the end user. Uh, of course, there were some experimental studies, but for the end user, I think we're we're we're here. I mean, this this is a nice um, depiction of the current status of uh, the most learning uh, studies or the, the use of model learning. Uh, because we're not sure if we can use it in a very productive way, but at the same time, we're so um, enthusiastic about how to look for possibilities. And today, I'm going to show you um, how I am. Uh, experimenting with this technology. So what is augmented reality? And how am I going to connect augmented reality with, with this model learning? Of course, I mean, augmented reality is, is a standalone technology on its own. But uh, thanks to the mobile devices, it, it became available to those, to the end user, to an average um, citizen. Who, who can afford a typical mobile device. So um, we could use our mobile devices that are really um, more advanced than they were in the past. And uh, they're equipped with cameras and with certain sensors, with a certain uh, strong processors, so that this situation enabled augmented reality to be housed or to be accommodated in those devices. So. Uh, but before that, let's just 
augmented definition, at least um, talk about it. Uh, have you ever heard of augmented reality before, or is it your first time hearing it? You've heard it, you've heard. Okay, you've seen it. Good, good, great. Okay. It's good for me to know like who my audience is, right? So I'm not going to repeat the things again and again. So uh, in its simplest term, augmented reality is the name of technology that enables overlaying virtual object data or information onto the object in the physical world, right? So it appears as if the virtual input is present in the same space. Uh, Azuma is one of the leading uh, scholars in this field. They, they did this like in 2001. For Azuma, which is most um, common, common and most accepted uh, definitions of augmented reality, Azuma says that a typical AR system possesses the following features. So it combines real and virtual objects in a real environment. Uh, it runs interactively and in real time and it registers real and virtual objects with each other. So how does that work? Let's look at uh, Milgram's reality and virtuality continuum to, to better understand where augmented reality stands, right? So this is the real environment. This is what real world looks like, our physical environment that, that surrounds us. And this is like one end, right? Uh, on the other end, of the continuum, you see this virtual environment, second life, right? Or there's OpenSim or there or active world, there are different virtual environments. Even Google, uh, Google Earth is a form of virtual environment. Things are completely virtual. So in between, towards, real, towards virtuality, we have augmented reality, which means placing real objects in, an, in a virtual world, let's say. And to this end, we have augmented reality, which means placing virtual objects in, uh, on physical objects of the real world. So this is like what it is, right? So what is the evolution of augmented reality? Let me quickly just give you a brief history of that, and then I'm going to show you like how I'm using it. So the the whole thing started in, uh, at Harvard University. Ivan Sutherland, in 1968, invented this ultimate display. Uh, I think he was, at that time, working for uh, Boeing, the aircraft company. And they were actually experimenting with uh, how to assemble or disassemble certain parts of uh, big aircrafts. Uh, in areas where they can't really reach, you know, like imagine um, a country in Africa or in Asia buys a big aircraft, but they don't know how to uh, maintain it. So if you just develop a device like this, you can actually uh, broadcast how it works right to the goggles of the technicians, so they can also follow, they can follow your instructions and then either assemble or disassemble parts. So that was the motivation. Uh, but even before that, we had the fantasy of overlaying some virtual information uh, on people, you can see like in fairy tales. Uh, of course, there, is, there are a lot of interesting uh, pieces of research in between. You know, people tried hard with mobile phones, people tried hard with uh, computers. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that part. If you're interested, of course, I can provide you more information about that. But um, I want to just talk more about how it became more common and accessible to those uh, who are actually um, regular people like, like me, you know, being a teacher and instructor at a university, how I could make most of it, how I could use this technology. So there are, well, thanks to the effort of software developers and um, hardware developers. Uh, I think iPad was a game changer in the, in the world of technology. So with iPads, with Android tablets and devices, uh, and with, with some augmented reality software, 
that that seem like work that are compatible with uh, other platforms. I could get some uh, some application that can run in these uh, platforms, and this is like from one of my classes from from one of my uh, classes in 2013 using an iPad, uh, a course about endangered studies, uh, endangered species. So I was just showing like um, elephants and other animals in 3D. So it could actually explore the animals. Uh, this is actually where we stand. I mean, it's not, this is what is available to the, uh, to the public at the moment. But um, what is actually coming soon is, actually as of yes, uh, announced the HoloLens. It's sad we heard that Google Glass project is actually, they just finalized for now, I don't know for what reason, uh, Google still promised they're gonna go on with the Glass project. But after all those years, three years or so, they said they don't want to go on with their Google Glass project. So I put HoloLens here by Microsoft. Uh, yesterday they announced this, it's a really cool thing. As we see, the, the person wears goggles here, and you see this virtual information here. It says recipes, if you can here, there's a to-do list, whoops, where it go? Ah, just because I clicked on it. All right, and um, do this. And there's this information here, and you can read the information here. So this is, uh, what is actually coming this year. And they, they said that it's gonna be working very well with uh, Windows 10, uh, we'll see. And what is actually after the waiting list is the, the augmented reality contact lens that's coming soon. So we don't have to wear any uh, anything around our bodies. It's just a small contact lens that we wear and then it's gonna be uh, showing us all this virtual uh, information. So how do we use augmented reality in education? Uh, there are different subject fields, different uh, applications. Augmented reality is has a great potential in, in history studies, historical studies. As you see, you just look at the site, you don't see anything, but when you look at it through a um, mobile device, you can see like how it used to look like uh, some hundred years ago. Or in geography, or in astronomy, like um, Google Sky, it shows you the, the, the maps of stars and asteroids, or like uh, how you can actually uh, place objects in this real world. Or in, in science, this is like a um, physics project. So simulating how um, sustainable energy, like how windmills work. Uh, art and design or architecture, again, like instead of um, having miniature models of buildings, you can actually uh, overlay a 3D version of it and then uh, view it through a tablet. And um, in, in medicine, again, you don't even, you don't need like um, corpses or uh, dead bodies in your lab. All you need is a tracker and then um, an iPad and then you can work on um, virtual buddies to, to explore human world, uh, human buddies. And, and in military, again, they use for uh, how to how to use specific weapons and um, how to uh, develop like like a strategy. So this is how it is used. So how am I using augmented reality? Uh, I'm not saying it's actually a great way of using augmented reality, but this is still something. I mean, this is what I could do. Um, I am teaching listening and speaking skills, right? This is my course book. Here it is. And I said, uh, maybe I can overlay some extra information um, on the book. So my students can interact with these virtual objects and then, uh, produce uh, in the target language. So what I was doing with them was uh, choosing specific uh, trigger images and then overlaying video information 
in advance. So when they scan the trigger image with their tablets, they could just view the video and then all the multimedia content, whatever it is, and then uh, follow the instructions given here. And after that, uh, clicking on it so that they can interact with, with the other people in the class. I actually prepared a video for that. Here's the video. I'm not going to play it, but I think Intelligent will help me play it. Uh, can we show it on a different browser? Sure. There. Yeah, yeah. I am here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh -huh. So can we play the video? Oh, there it is. So I use my iPad to record hey, this. Hey, I'm Anthony. This is the news. And Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Uh, I'm just looking for ways how to integrate the technology into language learning context. Because you know, language learning is 
completely different from other companies that I've ever even shipped. So I was rather uh, interested in how to uh, promote certain skills that were in development and that were kind of like previously unable to listen and do sort of in aggregation and, and that sort of uh, practice or not have the skills. Otherwise, that one way they were doing it was not going to help. So that was the idea behind Moodle. And Moodle is uh, Orion Language. And the idea I wanted to share with everybody is to work with it and then share my experience. So I'm just thinking about potential ways of integrating this technology. And this is what I've come up with. I've just seen three things that you can think of in terms of like simple modeling mechanisms and techniques. So I thought maybe in the uh, modeling frame, uh, we can actually learn some very key models by showing them a um, to the user first, and then uh, uh, maybe uh, input to the activity. So then, as a follow-up, the whole activity is input. You can use these techniques uh, in response to what they uh, want, and then uh, I did introduce some very simple examples to them. So you can use like um, Visual Studio. Images or um, some audio files or something like that, and then the uh, this content is used to sort of uh, direct the next uh, problem. So this here is the creative aspect of the of the of the machine, and then in the application side, what we what we were doing is that uh, we're using a couple of different techniques. You might ask, like, why we're not making this in the lab, for example. Well, you know, every company has their own and uh, they have their own way of doing it. So, what they're doing, what the benefit here is, okay, they can uh, rewind the interview they're doing, they can re interview, and they can sort of like uh, scroll their experience files uh, over and over again and sort of their, their best practices that they use to sort of like make it more impactful for them. And um, it's also fun to see the difference between the work and then more like uh, do everything uh, instead of um, writing down what you did. So it makes things like maybe even better for the for the more experienced users who are like sort of hands on Always um, compare and sort of like see who can see the most uh, impact on the technology. And the third action is easy. Uh, a mini authentic machine starts, you show them a mini authentic machine that you built, and then you're asking them to build your entire company. You know, in a, in a real classroom environment, that would be difficult to do because, you know, imagine you have 10 students, you're going to have students, uh, and then you expect them to like study for a paragraph. And it takes time to do it, but if you're in a real um, online, everyone is doing it for like you know uh, you know like like an hour, and they can go through the thing. So you know you sort of like to show that. And then the fourth action, uh, it's in your PhD. You can take problems and solutions and spread them to the problems that are the most uh, common to your students. So they can always watch. Well, it once, twice, three times, or like the fourth time, uh, they don't have the luxury of rewinding it and sort of showing it to the audience. But um, when you make it available for the person in front of the book, uh, they can always go back and then see it again and sort of see it back and then get to see it themselves. So that was the idea. That's, that's my model. And of course, this is kind of. Kind of work in progress. Uh, hopefully, we can sort of integrate and sort of uh, you know, 
that easy to use around here. So, so you know, you can just use the the name that you want. Uh, so that's my part. I'm going to share some uh, augmented reality applications that you can start playing with and then uh, uh, help me maybe or <coughs> contribute to the community. So I'm using a large map, which is image recognition technology. So you can make the image overlay on it uh, or put it around the image and then start playing one to one with it. Augmented is something that's very easy for the modeling. Uh, there are packet vector handlers that you can have running and you can make it very easy. So very late but short code. So once you train those, you can uh, place that 3D object and use it as a you know, useful object for your training data. There's Liar and Wikidoo and Gnome. These three are very similar. So layer, which is the one that you see here, there's a bunch of them that are used in my own uh, computer lab. What you're doing with these is uh, you can, these are location-based uh, augmented reality applications. So you can use your phone or your tablet or whatever device you have, and you can just hold it to the, the, to the physical object in that case, and then you can see, for example, let's say you're walking around the desert somewhere, if there's an entry in Wikipedia uh, for the for the mountain you have there, uh, Wikidoo shows you right on the right um, on that layer, or it shows you how far away it is, and it gives you some good information about it. And Green Tree, you can also uh, share your free your free book uh, code or your YouTube code. shows who's sharing what and how much code. So that's an interesting uh, interaction that you can have. And one thing that you should also do for Liar, which is again location based, but you can use some dropping audio content on some physical object. So let's say you have a trip to Popcorn Palace and then you talk about Popcorn Palace and you just drop it there. And whoever is actually traveling back to the lab uh, holds their phone to the sun and then they see your content, they click on it and then they listen to it. That would be not very interesting. You can organize your treasure hunt in the same sort of way. And finally there's Sam. Sam is your pet that you can actually keep and you can make him wait, but you can use these dropping uh, both visual and audio inputs. So you can for example you're going to uh, describe your apartment to your friend, you can put or you can locate a, um, an arrow going to the red door, and your friend can uh, turn her, his or her phone on when she sees the new neighborhood and she can see the sky, so she can see the, the, the arrow going to the red door. And uh, so you can do interesting things around the place. what I have so far. And yep, that's it. So I'm gonna just give thanks to you for giving the last 10 minutes. And um, here's my contact information. Feel free to write to me or add me to your world on LinkedIn or even my website. So it's not my site, but I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts and